Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for even more Daily Commander Legends Battle for Baldur Gate pre-con spoilers. So we're on to deck number two. We already talked about the Demir Horror deck. Next up is our weird Is It Go Dragon artifact deck called Draconic Descent. So this deck, oh my goodness, this deck has some of the sweetest cards from all of Commander Legends 2, I want to say. Some of my personal favorites at least which means we should probably jump right into it start breaking down the new cards before we do three quick reminders first number one we already did a video about the horror deck so i'll link it in a card put it in the description check that out if you haven't seen it yet number two if you need some of these cards you can get them from our awesome sponsor card kingdom over at cardkingdom.com slash mdg goldfish and number three to keep up on the latest spoilers throughout the day head on over to mtgpreviews.com anyway let's talk commander legends battle for brawler gate commander draconic descent all right so this deck is the Furkrog Cunning Instigator deck. And the theme, I guess, is kind of all over the place. It's essentially a is it goad artifact deck? I guess I would go with with some dragon sub themes. It's a little bit more scattered. The horror deck was pretty straightforward. This one kind of all over the place, but it's led by Furkrog. Not going to get into Furkrog again. We talked about it at the beginning of spoiler season, but it is a good reminder that it does lead the deck. As far as our backup commanders, once again, we got a background partner pairing with Bailoff and Clan Crafter. So Bailoff, five mana, two, five elf shaman, said, Creatures your opponents control with power less than its power are goaded. They have to attack each combat, but they can't attack you. Whenever a goaded attacking or blocking creature dies, you make a treasure and then you can choose a background. As far as the precon itself, the only background is Clan Crafter, but you could pair it with another one from the main set or whatever. Clan Crafter, two mana legendary enchantment background, says commander creatures you own have. Pay two, sack an artifact, put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature and draw a card. So let's start with the easier of these two cards. Clan Crafter. Obviously, if you're playing the Precon, you're going to play it with Bayloth, but you can do a bunch of things with this card. It reminds me the most of Psymaster Thopterus. We don't actually have a card in Magic that's pay anything, sack an artifact, draw a card, put a plus one, plus one counter on it that just hasn't existed before. Psy is the closest I could come up with. A pay two, sack two artifacts to draw a card. Clan Crafter, though, I think is a pretty legit option. If you want to play it as your commander, along with playing it with the Precon commander, there's a few other options. Some Choose a background commanders that can make artifacts. Ganix the dragon makes treasure tokens. Same with Safana that can make treasure tokens. Sivris cares about sacking artifacts. So those are some options if you want to play as your commander, but I don't think you have to necessarily play this as your commander. I can see, again, playing this in the 99 of specific decks. If you're a blue artifact deck that specifically cares about sacking artifacts, getting them in your graveyard, then this could be a sweet option. Like I'm thinking Emery, for example. You play this with Emery. Emery likes to cast artifacts artifacts from your graveyard, you can use Clan Crafter to sack artifacts to get them in your graveyard, then recast them with Emery, which seems pretty powerful, plus you grow your Emery or played in Brea, which is about sacking artifacts. So while most of the main set backgrounds felt like kind of meh cards for the 99, the ones from the precons actually seem pretty good. Going back to Bayloth, oh, this card's actually really sweet, and this is a card that actually has some really good backgrounds for it. Remember, it cares about its power. The bigger its power is, the more you're going to go the rest of the table. If if you can grow Bayloth big enough, you literally take and just goad everything. Nothing's going to be able to attack you, but everything's going to be smashing into your opponent's stuff's going to be dying. You're going to be making lots of treasures. So it works with Clan Crafter because Clan Crafter can turn your treasures into card draw while also growing Bayloth so it goads more in the future. But this is probably even better with like Raised by Giants. Just play Raised by Giants. Your Bayloth's going to be a 10 10. Nothing's going to be able to attack you. Criminal Pass, Noble Heritage, any of the Voltron style backgrounds will work really well with Bayloth. I also think that Bayloth is just one of the better goad commanders we've seen. There's not too many legends that can goad everything every turn. We see Marseille do it. Marseille is pretty good at it. You got to hit people in combat. Bayloth's even easier. All you got to do is make Bayloth big and you literally goad everything and get a bunch of treasures as a bonus. So I actually think this is just a legit strong goad commander that not only can be a commander, but you'll obviously play in the 99 of essentially any goad deck. Furkrog, Bog, Hezekar. If you're playing a goad deck, 
like this is gonna be in your deck it's gonna be really good if you want to build around it there's a few different ways you can pump it with artifacts equipment especially like a black braid reforge by itself in the mid game should be enough to go the entire table you can protect it as well with equipment that give it indestructible or lightning greaves or swift foot boots whatever so that's one plan you can also go with the aura plan that kind of works naturally with raised by giants that's since an enchantment we also got kaima from the kamigawa neon dynasty commander decks that kind of meshes together if you want to go weird gruel aura goad and then you can use rankers and classifications to make your bailoff big so i think bailoff is actually just a really strong card most of the background commanders i've been a little bit like yeah i don't know they don't look that powerful not so with bailoff bailoff if you want to goad things and you want to kind of voltron it and make this big it's a legit option and remember if you go voltron with bailoff it's going to be even better because if you goad everything those things have to attack which means most of your opponent's creatures are going to be tapped and then you can slip in for combat damage with your bailoff and win with commander damage we also also got spectacular showdown which i think is kind of an awesome card two mana sorcery put a double strike counter on target creature then goad each creature that had a double strike counter put on it this way so for two mana you give one of your things double strike forever essentially but it also has overload of seven if you do that you're gonna goad and double strike counter all of your opponent's creatures so none of those creatures can attack you but they're gonna have to attack so they're gonna smash into each other they're all gonna trade off they're all gonna deal tons of damage people are gonna die it is gonna be ridiculous this i believe is only the second card in all of magic they can put a double strike counter on something uh, the other one was avenging hump bonder which i don't think i've ever seen anyone play but that's a pretty powerful effect like when you consider that sorcery one shot double strike is one mana assault strobe uh, this is actually pretty efficient because you're kind of getting a equipment mode of this it's sticking around forever not quite as good as an equipment because if your creature dies the counter of course is going to go with it but still this is permanent double strike for two mana on any creature and then you get the upside of overloading which kind of turns it into an avatar of slaughter but a way better avatar of slaughter it's an avatar of slaughter that doesn't hurt you avatar of slaughter is absurd all creatures get double strike and have to attack each turn the problem is you spend eight mana on this and then mostly you get murdered by your opponents that attack you and then it dies and then you die and then it's off the table spectacular showdown is avatar of slaughter except none of the downside your opponents literally can't attack you but they still have to attack all their stuff still has double side assuming you can overload it which seems like just a pretty legitimate finisher like worst case it's a wrath best case people are just gonna die so i think this is gonna be at its best in voltron style decks blanca drago feather grieven zada kind of hilarious get it on your entire team and just smash people for a ton of damage a lord of tresser horn if you are trying to voltron giving any of these voltron commanders double Double strike hugely valuable and then is a bonus you get the upside of that late game overload wrath the board almost insurrection like it's going to sweep the board insurrection probably better because it usually just kills people but this is really going to be a seven mana wrath with a ton of upside so i think spectacular showdown is just a ridiculously strong card it might look weird it might not look that good but i think this card is legitimately great in any style of voltron deck and it might be even better than that this might just be a stable red isn't great at wrathing and this is really a seven mana wrath and i know seven mana is a lot but still in a color that doesn't really get wraths permanently goading and double striking all your opponent's team does seem like a hilariously effective way to get the job done we also got loot dispute which i think is pretty bad four man enchantment when it enters the battlefield you take initiative and get a treasure when you attack the player who has initiative you get a treasure and then when you've completed a dungeon create a five five dragon token with flying so Loot Dispute is a good reminder of how busted Smothering Tithe is. If you think about this card, it's going to make one treasure when it comes into play. And then if someone steals the initiative from you and then you attack them, you'll get another treasure. So at most, it's making one treasure every turn. Smothering Tithe usually just makes three treasures a turn and often more than that if people draw extra cards. So this just seems like pretty bad treasure production. Like even if you just want to make an extra mana every turn and want to attack, wouldn't it be better just to curse of opulence someone and get it that way? This seems way 
way easier. So I think you really got to be an initiative deck to want loot dispute. The problem is red is like the worst dungeon color. There's a random uncommon legend, I guess, in Commander Legends 2, a Zohan that cares about it a little bit. There's Zalto, which I've never seen anyone play, but that is a legendary red venture into a dungeon commander. And then there's uncommon partner pairings or background pairings, but it's just a really awkward color. I guess you could play it in a treasure deck, but I just don't feel like it makes enough treasures. When you consider how easy it is to make treasures and these mass bursts of treasures, I feel like loot dispute is just pretty underpowered. So I don't know, maybe there's some casual venture deck that wants to take advantage of it, but unless I'm missing something, my reading is this card just isn't very good. On the other hand, we got Death Kiss, which is pretty sweet. A six mana five, five beholder. It says whenever a creature in opponent controls attacks one of your opponents, double its power until end of turn. So designed to work with goading, but works with anyone attacking your opponents. And then you can pay red in double X to make it monstrous and goad up to X target creatures your opponents control. So Death Kiss, kind of a sweet way to mess with your opponent's combat. Again, it reminds me sort of of Avatar of Slaughter. If you think about doubling power, it's kind of like giving double strike, which kind of makes it like a Berserker's Onslaught for your opponent's creatures. But if you're goading stuff, this isn't going to hurt you at all. And I guess it won't hurt you at all anyway. Like if your opponents attack you, their stuff's not going to be double powered. So it's further going to incentivize your opponents to attack each other. And if you're goading your opponent's creatures, they're going to have to attack each other. And it even stacks with double strike. So if somehow you had Avatar of Slaughter, which it must be Avatar of Slaughter Day. I, we have not talked about this card in like five years of spoiler videos. I forgot almost it was a thing. It's just not a card anyone plays. I can't believe there's been two different cards in this one pre-con that kind of compare to it. But but it is a really powerful effect, being able to make your opponents smash into each other with pseudo double strike. And if you give your opponent's creatures actual double strike, maybe with a double strike counter, then it's even more scary because then that's a kind of quadruple strike or whatever. You get double power and double strike. Also compares a little bit to Gahaji, uh, way better than Gahaji, except you can't play it as your commander. So I think this is another easy inclusion in Go decks. If the idea of your deck is to make your opponents attack each other, this is a sweet finisher. You're doubling the power of the creatures that are attacking each other. Also kind of cute in attack style decks like Ishin. This could be a good option because Ishin, remember, doubles up any trigger on your things, no matter who's triggering it. So your death kiss from your opponents attacking each other is going to double your opponent's creatures power twice, which makes them even faster clocks. So death kiss, if you are playing some sort of combat shenanigan deck, playing some sort of go deck, Seems like a legit finisher. I know six mana is kind of a lot, but this offers a lot of power and a lot of damage. Speaking of goat creatures, we also got Bothersome Quasit, a three mana, three, two demon. With Menace, it says goaded creatures your opponent's control can't block, which again, is another really scary ability if you're goading everything, because goading means your opponents have to attack each other. One of the ways to survive that for your opponents is by blocking, but if you goad everything, your opponents aren't gonna be able to block each other's attacks and people are gonna die and then whenever you cast a non-creature spell go target creature in opponent's control so the most obvious home for this is mass go deck something like Bailoff, decks that are playing disrupt decorum if you can goad all of your opponent's thing this is just going to kill people in the late game your opponent stuff's all goaded so they have to attack each other but no one can block so people are just gonna die to combat damage if there's a big board full of creatures the sneakier pace to play this though is fairly in a spell slinger deck. If you are regularly casting non-creature spells, this is like a really weird removal spell. Your opponent has some big threat that you're worried about getting killed by. You cast a brainstorm, whatever spell, and you go that, that's gonna have to attack your opponents, you're not taking damage, and then the next turn, you can do it again and do it again. If you cast enough spells, you can be goading the entire board the whole time. So we don't really have goad spell slinger as an archetype, but I could see just playing this in a utility or removal slot in a deck that's casting a lot of spells because I think just getting rid of one or two of the best creatures, keeping them from attacking you like a small foggy churn, I think that's enough value to make this worth a slot in your deck. So Botherum Quasit, I like this card. Good in go decks, maybe good in spell slinger too. We also got Mocking Doppelganger, which it's a doppelganger, a clone with a slight upside. Four mana flash. You may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature in opponent controls, except other creatures with the same name as this creature are goaded. So you flash this in, copy one of your opponent's things, you get a copy of it, their copy gets goaded. I mean, 
It's an upgraded clone. It's nice that it has flash. The goading thing is also a slight upside. If you want a clone in your deck, it's not a bad one. We just get so many clones these days that it's hard for me to get super hyped for another four mana clone. Even though this is one that if you're playing a goad deck or can work with its theme in some way, it's a fine option. We also got Artificer's Class, a two mana class enchantment. This is the first artifact spell you cast each turn. Costs one less to cast. Then for two mana, you can level up to level two. This says when this becomes level two. Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal an artifact card. Put that card in your hand, the rest in the bottom in a random order. And then level three costs six mana and says at the beginning of your end step, create a token that's a copy of target artifact you control. So Artificer's Class, kind of a weird card in the context of this pre-con. We haven't seen a lot of artifact specific cards, but in an artifact deck, this is pretty good. You get a Foundry Inspector for your first spell each turn. So it's not great as a ramp spell, but it's okay. And then you kind of get a Glint Nest Crane. I know it's not the same. You don't get the actual card selection. We haven't really had this ability before. They just reveal cards. Essentially, you're going to draw an artifact. It's going to be whatever the top artifact is of your deck, and it goes to your hand. And then level six essentially gives you an Echo Storm each turn. You got to copy your own artifacts, but still being able to copy any artifact you control for free each turn really Really strong and it triggers on your end step so that means the turn that you spend six mana to level this up you're gonna get to copy something right away which is huge if you had to wait until your next upkeep this probably wouldn't be a very playable card but because you can get the first copy right away it makes it a lot easier and more justifiable to spend your mana to upgrade this card it is possible to manipulate the second level if you play literally only one artifact in your deck you know that when you level this up that's what you're gonna find I don't think most commander decks can do that because you want to have your mana rocks, especially if you're an artifact deck. You wouldn't really be able to take advantage of the other levels very well without additional artifacts in your deck. But it's worth keeping in mind, maybe there's some weird combo that takes advantage of that. As far as where to play this, it's going to have home in artifact decks, especially artifact token decks. Probably the best home for this is Burdeclad, where you're going to be able to turn things into artifacts, which is what Burdeclad wants. But really, I think this is enough value that I'd consider it in Urza or Brea or Shikori Vehicles or Silas Ren. It's just a good value card in an artifact style deck. We also got, oh my god, probably the best card in this deck. We saved the very best for last in Astral Dragon. And this card is so incredibly sweet. Is it good? I don't know, it's eight mana, but wow, is this the sweetest card. Eight mana, four, four dragon, and it is flying, and it says when it enters the battlefield, create two tokens that are copies of target non-creature permanents, except they're three, three dragon creatures in addition to their other types, and they have fly. So essentially, this comes into play. You get to choose a non-creature permanent, and you get two, three, three dragon copies of them. So this is a fine value card, but really, I think it's mostly going to be a combo piece. There are many ways to go infinite with this. The simplest is like Cursed Mirror Dad. And so the many, these non-creature permanents that copy creatures. So essentially how this would work is, yeah, you have your curse mirror, your astro dragon, you copy the curse mirror. The curse mirrors are going to become three, three dragons. It can become copies of creatures, which will be astral dragon. And then astral dragon will copy the curse mirror. The end result making infinite three, three hasty astral dragons. Can you do the same thing without haste with dance of the many? Just keep copying it. So that's one easy way to go. But really what I'm hyped about is playing this in like Yarrick Panharmonicon decks. I just want to make three, three dragon Panharmonicons. If you get Panharmonicons out or Yarrick's out and you start doing this, you're going to make so many copies of things. It is going to be so spectacular. If you want to just infinitely loop you can use like oblivion ring or banishing light if you stack your triggers properly you can just keep exiling the dragon forever which is really weird you make like two oblivion rings one targets astral dragon one targets oblivion ring then when they resolve you get your astral dragon back from exile then you do it again and do it again so you generate infinite enters and leaves the battlefield triggers if you have a payoff for that or you just kind of troll everyone and loop for a while also seems sweet with token doublers uh, doubling season anointed procession the same thing we were talking about with panorama on in Yarok, it kind of do the same thing in a different way with the token doublers. And this is an ETB trigger. It's an ETB trigger, which means you can ephemerate or ghostly flicker and just keep blinking this to make more and more three, three dragon copies. You can end up with infinite Panharmonicons on the battlefield. I guess not infinite, but imagine 20 Panharmonicons in casting a Moldrifter or something. It would be so spectacular. And it even copies land. So if you want to make more fields of the dead and make a ton of zombies or Cabal Coffers to make a ton of mana, this could do that as well. 
Well, Astral Dragon, it's eight mana. At eight mana, I think things are pretty safe. But this has tons of combos. It's a fine value card. It's a sweet Banner Bodica card. It might be my favorite card from this entire Commander pre-god. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our Dragony pre-god. So let me know what you think about this deck. Which card is your favorite? What are you hyped about? Let me know in the comments. And I'll be back tomorrow when we have two more Commander pre-cons to go over. So until then, everyone, have a wonderful night and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.